Hello and welcome to my new tutorial series on reinforcement learning theory. This is something I'm super excited for. If you don't know what reinforcement learning is um, or you're curious to find out, definitely stick around. I'm going to explain all of that and more in a series of tutorials, and this is going to be the first one. This is something I'm really excited about because reinforcement learning is a type of AI that I find personally to be the most interesting out of all sort of the subfields out there. And it's very powerful and can do some really cool things, everything from playing chess to self-driving cars and robotics, really incredible stuff. So I wanna first go into just briefly what I'm gonna be going over in this entire series and what you can kind of expect from this. Right now I do lots of tutorials on all sorts of cool algorithms, um, all sorts of projects, but when I explain them, I, I kind of have to dumb things down a bit because I, I don't have the time to go over all these in-depth concepts and sort of where they come from, right? I, you know, there's only so much I can put into one video and I'm hoping this series will be able to bridge that gap and show you all what goes on behind the scenes, how these algorithms were developed, what's the math behind it, what's the theory behind it, give you an intuitive sense of why they work. And that's kind of what I'm hoping this series will do. So this is something I'm super excited for in terms of the curriculum I'm going over. Um, I'm very, very closely mirroring OpenAI's resource called Spinning Up. It's a written resource, highly recommend you check it out. If you haven't seen it, it's great. Um, I'm gonna be going over almost the exact same things. I'll pro I do sort of put my spin on it in some places, add and take some things out. Um, but if you would prefer to read it, it's there and it's super awesome. So that's what this series is gonna be all about. Let's sort of get into it. I, I wanna start with why I love reinforcement learning, why I think it's so dang awesome and why I think it's gonna serve a huge role in the overall field of AI in the coming years and sort of what its role will be. Let's start with some examples, um, right? So some examples of where reinforcement learning has been used recently, games like chess, Go, StarCraft 2, uh, Dota 2, it's Dota 2, right? Not just Dota. I might be absolutely crazy if I am, oops. Uh, let's see what else. There's self-driving cars, as I mentioned. Self-driving cars. And there's also robotics is a big one. Now, these are not all the things it can do. Robotics is a... Uh, but these, these are some, some of them, right? Games are, are an obvious uh, common, commonality here, but also self-driving cars and robotics. And these, these are probably things you might or might have not heard of. I think self-driving cars have been particularly big recently. Uh, but what's really cool is reinforcement learning can do all things and not just like crappily do them or, or kind of do them. It can do all of these at better than a human can do them, right? At state-of-the-art levels. It's uh, some really crazy stuff. And... What do all these have in common, though, is, is maybe an interesting question that allows them to work with reinforcement learning. And the answer to that question is reward. You are going to hear this come up again and again and again because this is what reinforcement learning is all about. It's about maximizing reward. You want to maximize some reward. So in, in these environments, right, what would, and I call each of these environments, right, uh, we'll have lots of different types of environments, um, what might a reward be? Chess, it could be, you know, maybe you get a positive reward, like five or one, some numeric value specifically, for when you take an enemy's piece, or when you win the game, right? So maybe, maybe let's make it simple, you get plus one when you win the game, or negative one if you lose the game. Could be the same thing for Go or StarCraft 2 or Dota 2. Um, some of these are more complicated, so maybe we'll have surrogate rewards um, or, or sort of more smaller rewards. So maybe StarCraft 2, you have like an economy to, man to manage, right? Maybe the more resources, the higher your reward. Self-driving cars, um, crashing, you know, uh, hopefully that would give us a really low reward. Um, and really these are just all relative to each other. So maybe getting to our destination gives us like plus 100, um, and crashing gives us uh, minus five and all the other time we're just getting zero or you know something like that. Maybe, maybe you'll want to penalize a little higher if you like hit a civilian, that's pretty bad. Um, and you know, we, we can keep going with this. Robotics will probably depend on the specific task. But what's really crazy is that based on this one sort of reward signal, just these numbers we're getting, this single list of numbers we get, 
we can train an algorithm to drive cars, do robotics, play games better than any human can. That's pretty crazy when you think about it. It's, it's such a small signal, yet we can do so much with it. So let's start talking about how we will start to formalize this, right? Because these all have a reward we can associate them. There are lots of other commonalities. And when we're working with reinforcement learning, one concept that is very helpful to know that comes up in things like papers a lot, and hopefully, by the way, if you get through this series, you'll be better a lot, like maybe able to read papers uh, at sort of at the state of the art level in the field. That is one of my hopes uh, for this series. Um, but among the environments I just had listed, they have many commonalities. One commonality is a state space. So we'll call S is a state space. And maybe I'll do a colon here. Um, and let's, let's take the example of tic-tac-toe. You know, it's pretty simple. The state space is all the possible combinations of states that can exist. And when I say a state, I mean a particular configuration of the environment. So an empty board is one configuration. Uh, an empty board except maybe we have this one, this sort of area right here has an O. That's another state. Um, and we can have you know numerous states. There's a limited amount in this case, but in some cases, maybe there's unlimited possible states. But that's the state space. It will be a set of all of these things. So big S is, is sort of representing all of those. Um, S0, little s0 might be one state. S1 might be another state. And, and you know the list goes on. And big S encompasses all of those. OK, cool. So not too bad. Next thing we're going to do is P0. What's P0? Um, P0 is a distribution over all possible starting states. Starting state distribution. And what just, oh God, distrib, I, I swear I can spell distribution. It's hard to do this while talking at the same time. Um, starting state distribution. And what does this mean? Well, it means in tic-tac-toe, we always start with an open board, right? Um, but in some games, there are variations of how you start. Uh, even in tic-tac-toe, actually, we can say maybe it is O's turn to go first, or maybe it's X's turn to go first. That, that actually is a variation right there, right? So the distribution over O going first and X going first, these two states might be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, right? They both have a 50% chance of happening. Um, or maybe you play where one always goes first. I think that might be a more common thing, in which case maybe uh, the distribution would be there's only one possible thing, and the chance of that happening is 100%. Uh, so this is a fairly simple example, uh, but this is one sort of thing we have here. The next thing they have in common is they all can be given in action space. Action space. Just like we have a state space uh, and states, we always have actions. An action is, for example, placing an O in this area, then placing an X in this area. Those are two distinct actions. And each one of those, uh, so maybe we can call those A1, uh, A2, A3, and so on, they all form up to form an action space, which we'll denote with big A. It's all possible actions that can take in. Um, sometimes this, usually this includes only legal actions, although you can have some sort of variations here. The next thing is a bit more interesting. Uh, we'll represent it with big P, and it is the transition function. Transition function. And it sort of relies on this state space and this action space, right? Uh, the transition function maps, so if we say P of Let's say, let's say uh, A1, it could be any action, right? Uh, the probability of, or am I writing this right? I guess it would be probably of S P plus one uh, given A uh, zero, or sorry, I'd say A of T and S of T. Uh, okay, what does this mean? Uh, the transition function takes in two sort of parameters right here, right? We have an action we're taking and a state that we're in. So this is essentially saying if we're in state T and we're taking action at time step T, right? So may maybe this is maybe this is state T and 
action T is placing X right here, right? Uh, well, what's the probability that we end up in state T plus one? And this could be any state, right? Um, so in this case, this is actually very simple uh, because the, prob the transition function for tic-tac-toe, well, whenever we place an X somewhere in O somewhere, we always know what the outcome is, right? If I place an X in the center, I'm always gonna end up with a board or a state where the X is in the center and everything else is exactly where it was before. So there's actually, this is completely deterministic in the case of something like tic-tac-toe, but there are other environments where that might not be the case. And maybe we click one button in a game, but it could do multiple things or have multiple effects. And that's sort of where this comes into play. This will tell us, well, what's the probability of something like X happening versus Y happening when we uh, press the space bar. So if you ever play games with RNG, uh, this is going to be, you know, not so simple. That is sort of an overview of the, the transition function. And lastly, we have the oh so great reward function, which we're going to denote with big R. So reward function. Okay, so the reward function looks a little something like this. We have a function that takes in three different inputs, the current state, the action we're taking in the current state, and the next state. And the reason I've been writing T, by the way, is these, that's the sort of sub, whatever it's called here, is because T stands for time step. Uh, generally, we have, or always, we have discrete time steps, right? Which means that, uh, you know, like in tic-tac-toe, uh, we have one time step, one player makes a move, then the next step, the other player makes the move, and we always get one state sort of each time. We're progressing one step at a time, right? So ST is a state at that particular time. Action of T is the action that, uh, follows getting the state and then this was supposed to be an s s of t plus one is the state that happens after this state after taking this action and this maps out to a reward at time t so this is essentially saying if we're in one state we take an action and end up in another state what reward do we get from that and that's just the formal way of of essentially saying these give rewards right so in this case if i back up here uh, in this example, and I place an X here, what reward do I get for that? Well, technically we can make our own reward function, but I, let's say zero maybe, right? If O goes here, maybe O gets zero, another zero reward. Well, if X places one here, well, hold on a second, we just won the game. So we'll probably want something like a plus one reward to you know, uh, say, good job, you did something good, let's give you a reward to keep reproducing that behavior. So that is what the reward function is. Now, you can imagine that this sort of thing can be applied to many other environments. Um, a matter of fact, it can be applied to so many different environments and it's so popular, it has a, a very, uh, it is actually a very formal thing called a Markov decision process. This formalization, um, MDP for short. And you'll see this come up a lot in papers uh, because it's a very helpful formalism for reinforcement learning because we can use all these different ideas um, a lot and we can reuse them a lot. And what we'll actually end up doing in future episodes is we will break our problems down into these states or sort of these uh, specific elements right here and then we'll construct algorithms using these elements to learn, make AI that can learn. You can imagine this can be used on things like, you know, everything from tic-tac-toe to self-driving cars. We could make Pac-Man work with this, right? You could say the state is where all the pixels are, or maybe it's where the ghosts are, where your character is, um, how, what your score is. Uh, you know, the reward function might be based off your, your in-game score. Uh, the transition function is always going to, actually uh, the transition function in Pac-Man would not be deterministic. Uh, well, if the ghosts are random, right? Because if you go right, you can't control what the ghosts are gonna do. Um, so that's one case where this wouldn't be deterministic. The action space would be like up, down, right, left. Um, and the starting state, I think it always starts in the same state. But uh, you, you can see how this can be applied to a lot of things.
that's where we're actually going to leave off for this video with these Markov decision processes. I really appreciate it if you stuck around to the end. If you like and subscribe, it really means a lot. You don't have to, or leave a dislike, you know, do you do you. Um, but, but I hope you enjoyed. I hope this was helpful. And if you're interested in this type of stuff, I already have more episodes planned and scheduled to come out. So definitely uh, stick around. And thank you so much for watching, and I hope to catch you next time.